Thank you guys for having me here. I'm glad I made the trip over here. Um, so what we're going to talk about today is digital filmmaking, uh, what that means, and really how we got here, kind of a brief history of the milestones in that progression. Film has been around um, for over a hundred years. The basic mechanics of it kind of didn't change for a hundred years. The same film that that's Thomas Edison, I think that's George Eastman, I'm not sure. But this same film that they used in those cameras, which is 35 millimeters, four perforations, you can take a piece of that film from back in the old days and use it on a modern projector. It still works. So to kind of understand what this argument is about, there's a few basics about you know, how these um, how these two uh, things work. There's a film camera. As you can see, this part on top of it is where the film goes. That's the magazine. It's a big, heavy thing that shoots about 10 minutes of film. Uh, probably weighs about 25 pounds. And as you guys know, you know, on your camera, you can put in a little card that I don't even know how much it weighs. Maybe it doesn't weigh anything. And it can shoot about 40 minutes, an hour, with digital, you're capturing photons of light, uh, similar to a piece of film, but it's hitting um, a chip, which is measuring or turning the amount of light into an electronic signal, which is then recorded, like you record any digital information as a series of ones and zeros that represent that electrical process. So here's the image, kind of an ugly tree. Comes through a lens. Um, it hits a filter, which, uh, which measures red, green, and blue, the amount of red, green, and blue get combined to make all the other beautiful colors we see. Um, it gets processed in a computer and made into an image which represents that amount of light. It all happens instantaneously. How did we get to where we are today? Let's see. These two guys, George Smith, Willard Boyle, invented uh, the CCD chip. So they came up with the device and the way of uh, recording electronics and, and they, as soon as they came up with that they thought wow you could actually use a computer chip as an image sensor and record images that way. When they first um, did this in 1969 there was not a camera so this is probably a few years later. Um, it's kind of weird sitting on a desk like that but that's how they did it in the 70s I guess. <laughs> So one of the first ways that digital really got its foot into the filmmaking world was through editing. Even before the camera and, and visual effects and all those other things that we're going to talk about. In the olden days, film was edited in a room somewhat like this. This is from a movie, uh, Howard Hughes. It's not a real edit room, but it's pretty accurate representation of it. Uh, uh, traditionally, uh, women were, uh, were editors more than men. Um, this is Ann Coates, even though she's acting as an editor here, she's actually an editor in real life. She's in Side by Side. She's a very sweet uh, British lady. She edited um, Lawrence of Arabia, and even to this day, she's editing right now. I know she's working on uh, Fifty Shades of Grey. She's editing that. Um, so. You know, there's a lot of people involved. There's film all over the place. It's a very physical thing. You're carrying things. You're wearing gloves. You're chopping things. You're using glue. It looks a bit chaotic. Um, George Lucas started to develop a, a digital editing a program that you know you could you could um, take your film, scan it. You're in the digital world, and you could start editing it electronically. So you didn't need that room full of people. And George Lucas said, why are we still shooting film? Why can't, I, why can't we make a digital camera that has a better image quality and then we can skip that whole stage of scanning and we're immediately in the digital world. We're working with our color correct. We're working with our visual effects. So he worked with Sony and helped develop a camera that shot high def. So much more uh, resolution, much more information going into the camera. Still not as good as film, but George thought it was great. There he is with the camera he helped develop, and he shot 
Attack of the Clones in 2002 on a digital camera. That was the first movie to use this high-def camera. Sin City uh, kind of took all these things of visual effects, of indie films, and of color correct being able to do you know, wild things you had never before been able to do with the image, and kind of, to me, was the first movie that really combined all that, and that was Robert Rodriguez. Um, he wrote a great book called uh, Rebel Without a Crew. I'd recommend it to anyone if you, if you guys haven't read it. It's, it's kind of a diary he kept when he made his first movie. He made it for $7,000, and he, he kept a diary of how he did it. And I, I don't know, as a young filmmaker, uh, I found it very in inspiring. So I'd recommend it. Anyway, Sin City was a pretty cool looking movie. I remember when it first came out, everyone was like, how did they do that? Half of it's black and white, and certain things are color. Again, that's because of digital. But those cameras that George Lucas developed and Robert Rodriguez used were very expensive. They were maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, so if you were still an indie filmmaker, you had to use the little cheap ones that didn't look good. Until the RED camera came out. Uh, RED was developed by a guy named Jim Gennard, who was kind of a cool guy. He had started a company with something like $600, and it was Oakley, those, you know, kind of ugly looking uh, sunglasses. I guess some of them look all right. But uh, he ended up building that business up. He sold it for four billion, something like that. So he was done. He could do whatever he wanted in life, go to the beach, have a drink. But instead, he said he was really into photography and things like that. So he, he saw that film was kind of going away. And he thought that the Sony camera and the other cameras were kind of inferior. And he said, well, if film's going to go away, why don't we have something that's actually you know, looks good. And so this camera was about, when it came out, like $30,000, $35,000. So incredibly less expensive than what had previously been available. So now kind of indie films and stuff could start shooting digitally at, at a low cost of entry, the Airy Alexa. And a lot of cinematographers seemed to feel more comfortable using that. You know, they recognized the name, they knew it was quality. And, um, that camera came out kind of as we started shooting side by side. It wasn't even on the market, and now it is everywhere. It's uh, used a lot, and the red is too, and the red has continued to improve and put out different uh, versions. The DSLR cameras, like the Canons and the Nikons, I'm sure you guys know about those and use them. Those combined with the internet, with tablets, iPads, smartphones, things like that, it's all part of the process of democratization. So nowadays you can get a camera that shoots an amazing looking image, way better than probably what they sh George Lucas used on Attack of the Clones for you know a pretty low price. You can maybe buy one, you can borrow one, you can shoot something that looks great. Maybe not as good as film, but it looks pretty great. Uh, you can do that low cost. You can put it on the internet. People can watch it. They don't need to go to a theater to see it. They can watch it on their phone. They can hear about it, uh, communicate with different people all over the world. To me, that's the most amazing thing about digital technology is no longer do you have to live in New York or LA or some big city and have access to a lab and lots of money and a giant crew and a projector to tell your story. The DP or the director of photography or the cinematographer, it's all the same. That person's really in charge of, during production, um, the types of shot, the compositions of them, uh, the movements of the camera, capturing the image um, to best tell the story and to best support the director. The editor is in post-production and they're you know going through the script, telling the story and picking the best shots. Usually those guys don't um, necessarily um, overlap very much unless an editor is saying, hey, we're not getting the coverage we really need to be able to tell the story. We don't have a shot of such and such, or it would be really great to you know, see this certain shot in this scene, and maybe those kind of conversations go on. Usually most of the friction I've noticed in a movie production is probably between the producer and the director. So the director has a vision. He wants to make this 
certain thing and the producer has a budget and <laughs> sometimes those things don't fit within each other as post production supervisor you're off and probably a, a UPM on the set you're often in the middle of that so the director says to me hey I want 10 days to do the sound mix or I want this song in the movie and I will then go talk to the producer about it and they'll say well you can have one day and we can't afford the song so you know, a lot of times they communicate with each other but sometimes um, if there ever if there is problems it, it sometimes you have to kind of negotiate between the two folks which is all right I don't mind doing that <laughs>
And on that note, thank you, thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, we're part of a, a program with the U.S. Embassy, and um, we are, it's kind of a cultural exchange, so it's documentaries um, that the, the State Department uh, chose. It's also with the USC uh, film program, and it's, it's all over the world, going to different countries, showing the documentaries, interacting with students, learning from them, maybe they learn something from us. Uh, screening the movies and uh, just so we can get to know each other a little better they can ask questions about how we made the films what documentaries are like in America uh, we can find out what things are going on here um, it's just you know face-to-face -face communication I think it's a great program it's been great I've, I've been here only about four days in Athens but uh, I love it um, we've had a, a screening um, question and answer uh, I've done two workshops where I, you know, give a little presentation to students about digital and film and the, and the revolution, evolution that we're involved in now. And then what's been really exciting and lively are the um, discussions afterward where students ask me questions and, you know, we uh, exchange information and ideas about where, you know, we are in the world with technology and filmmaking and documentary filmmaking. Um, I know it's really inspiring for me to see so many young people that are, you know, really interested in this and want to tell their stories and want to know if there's any tips or, or ways that they can improve that. I, I, I think it's great, so I'm uh, getting a lot out of it. I hope they are too. I'd say uh, if you really want to be a filmmaker, I think it's something you can do. It's a possibility. Um, that was something that worried me at first when I started. Is this really something I can be? Who am I? To be like, I want to be a filmmaker, you and everybody else. But I think you can do it. I think we live in an era where content is constantly needed and being created for all these different channels and websites and webcasts and movies. So having just an actual skill of like being a, knowing how to use a camera, knowing how to edit, knowing how to do sound, I think those are actually valuable things and it's a true career you can have. On the artsy side, it's a little bit more difficult, but if you can combine those two things, um, you can do it. If you want to go out and make a documentary or, or a low budget film, the technology is there nowadays that you can shoot it, edit it, share it with the world, market it online, communicate with people about it. You might not get rich doing it, um, but if you enjoy it, you should, you should do that and try to do the best job you can. Hello, SAE Athens. Um, keep up the good work work hard and uh, follow your dreams. Mm -hmm.